welcome back hope you guys have uh, enjoyed previous lecture on the same topic clock domain crossing so we discussed the basics about uh, clock domain crossings when multiple signals cross uh, clock domains and uh, we discussed some solutions why do we need to pay special attention for uh, CDC signals okay um, as you can see here in this uh, diagram that this is clock domain one and some signals are crossing from one clock domain to second clock domain now if you do not put any logic or if you do not do anything is this okay no what can you do you got to take care of uh, of these signals which cross from one clock domain to another clock domain now we uh, discussed about two classes data signals and control signals in the previous lecture so data signals like data bus okay or group of signals which are you may say uh, more or less uh, uh, like say 32 bit data okay that uh, group of data look like a data bus or are not changing very often or changing very often for example they depends so how do you classify your signals and some control signals okay so for control signal a one bit signal it's a very simple scheme that you may use a synchronizer Either you have synchronizer in your uh, technology library and you just use as a cell or you use double flops okay for example here for synchronizing uh, the signal and before using the signal C in second clock domain uh, I'm using these uh, these two flops and I'm saying it's synchronizing circuit because this may have one flop, two flop, three flop, depending upon technology requirements. So let's make life simple, call it a synchronizer, okay? Uh, assuming that uh, it will have uh, same delay requirement as uh, ordinary flop. So we are good, okay? We pass this signal and uh, with a delay of uh, two clock and it will be properly uh, latched in, in the second clock domain. So that's fine. but Think about when we have uh, many lines, uh, data lines, 32-bit, 64-bit, 128-bit, putting these synchronizer for each bit is not going to solve our problem because we are reading these data bits together. Okay, So what happens that if uh, D2, let's say uh, this is my clock, And what happens if D2 toggles here and uh, D1 is supposed to toggle at the same time but toggles little late and we're gonna you know capture the wrong logic if if we want to use uh, say synchronizer for each bit that's not a good solution because you don't know uh, whether this synchronizing flop will go to metastable uh, or not. Usually, it, it is supposed to go, uh, signal is supposed to stable on the subsequent clock cycle. But you don't know what is the uh, stable state, okay? So you might end up uh, latching the wrong data. So what are the techniques which are uh, popular in literature or in practice and industry? So we're going to discuss two techniques today uh, in a very simple example. One is closed loop uh, MCP implementation techniques. MCP here means multi-cycle path. Second technique is FIFOs. So some of you guys have uh, requested to create a video on, on 5-4 technique for CDC uh, signals. So we're going to talk about 5-4s uh, as well. So let's talk about uh, first 
closed loop MCP solutions. So let's let's think for a second. Okay, we have uh, these databases. What if we generate a enable signal? Okay. Uh, in first clock domain, we write a state machine and generate some sort of enable signal, which tells that okay, now data is ready or uh, I I made that data available to pick up on that uh, data bus. And then we pass this enable signal to second clock domain. And bingo, we have solved this problem. We created one control signal, just one bit, and we're going to pass this signal across to the second clock domain. But it's not so simple because if you just pass this signal, um, how long that uh, enable would be high and uh, how would you make sure that on each clock cycle uh, you receive the right data or some sort of a, a synchronizing mechanism which will allow us to uh, send and receive the correct data. Okay, So let's uh, pay more attention to the first clock domain enabling thing. Okay, So let's draw a little circuit. What we did here, uh, we essentially generated an enable signal passed through a flip-flop and then looped back and XORed it. So what this signal is saying that this signal will generate a pulse. What it means that we transfer one pulse and that means that one pulse and one data, you just take it from the data bus. Okay, good. The next data would be available on the next pulse. And that scheme can continue. Okay. However, it is just one way. We haven't uh, uh, got a full confirmation from the second clock domain that second clock domain has properly uh, receive the data or not. So we're going to uh, increase or the complexity of the logic implementation on first clock domain. Let's see how we can do that. Okay, so we, we passed this enable pulse and we synchronized it okay, via synchronizing flops. And now here, here, after we, we receive this control signal, this control signal can go back to the first clock domain and act as a feedback or acknowledge that, okay, I have received this pulse here. Okay. Now, at that pulse, we want to have this data read. Okay. So we kind of doing this kind of circuitry, which will create a pulse. Now, this circuitry flip-flop and XOR gate, this will help us or this will avoid the error of whether it's uh, high pulse or whether it is uh, low pulse. Okay. Low pulse, so whether it is this kind of pulse or this kind of pulse. So it will make sure that only one pulse goes to enable and it, 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 there is no requirement uh, you have to worry about whether it's a high pulse or low pulse. You just get one enable. And uh, these flops, flip flops, uh, these are a special flip flops, you may call it, or you may say it's a multiplexed flip flops with the enable signal. When the enable is high, then only the data will be latched. Good. And this acknowledgement signal, we can. Uh, send it back to the sending clock domain with the proper synchronizing mechanism and same way the stable pulse okay going back to our uh, state machine now it's a simple implementation good but notice here that uh, we're gonna lose one clock cycle here one here one here one here so at least uh, uh, four clock cycles while we are sending this enable signal 
and then three clock cycles looping back the acknowledgement signal. So we have the penalty of uh, seven clock cycles. So if we, we can do fairly a good job with this kind of circuitry if we don't have high speed requirement uh, or uh, we are okay with, with that delay okay, or with that penalty. But sometimes for high speed designs, we, uh, we are too tight for uh, in our time uh, timing budget that uh, we want to reduce or we want to get data as fast as possible. And that's where uh, the FIFOs, asynchronous FIFOs or uh, 2D FIFO structures come in place for multi-bit crossing. Now overhead of FIFOs is that you have to maintain a memory. memory requirement and then um, there is a uh, uh, special implementation techniques uh, for FIFO which may uh, uh, which may be overhead for for the area but having said that they give you the faster implementation you can reduce the the delay from seven clock cycle to at least you can save uh, one clock cycle each way. So two, at least minimum two you can, well, at max two you can save, uh, you can save even more depending upon your implementation. So I'm not gonna go in detail how many clock cycles you can, you can save, but we're, we're gonna check uh, uh, that how we can implement using FIFOs. Any simple structure in a FIFO, you have uh, this memory Re, uh, read address, write address, write enable. A very simple structure. You can have more complex uh, memory structure where more inputs, more outputs, uh, and then memories have inherent uh, problems. You have to, um, uh, there, there are other sort of problems that's out of scope of this lecture, but uh, but definitely uh, uh, memories, uh, asynchronous FIFOs, FIFOs are heavily used in real designs, uh, high-speed designs, okay? So let's say uh, FIFO, good. So when write enable is high, okay, we write into the FIFO and uh, then in the another clock domain, we read from this uh, memory. This is memory, okay, it's a dual port memory. So it works on two clocks, write clock and read clock. Write clock in one clock domain, writing the data. Read clock in another clock domain, uh, reading the data, okay. So that's. Now let's focus on the uh, structure on first clock domain. So we are, we want to send uh, the write enable signal, okay, good. So write enable signal, fine. Now write pointer, it indicates that where do we write, okay, which address do we write. Now write pointer essentially points to the next address, okay, next free address where uh, the data is going to be written. Now there are techniques that uh, you can convert binary addresses to gray code addresses where uh, only one bit is changing. So here write point pointer is essentially one bit. Okay, so I haven't shown here that uh, the binary to gray code conversion and then only one bit is changing. Okay. And same way here the read pointer from gray to binary conversion and binary to gray, vice versa, good. And then same same technique that uh, write enable and then XORD and uh, with a flip flop generating a pulse. Okay. Now interesting thing here comes that uh, when is the ready signal? 
what what do we mean by the radius sigma well it simply says that uh, that my my phi 4 is now ready okay so you want to write but what if the phi 4 is uh, or the memory is not ready what if the uh, second clock domain has not uh, read the data from this memory and if you issue the right signal it will overwrite we don't want that okay so we need to uh, make sure that uh, the second clock domain has read the data then only we're going to write the data into the memory because we have we have the limited amount of memory we don't have infinite memory that we can we can keep on writing in in this uh, memory okay so we need some sort of way to know in first clock domain okay when the memory or the FIFO is ready good so what we did here simply we pass the read pointer one bit signal read pointer and you may think of it say too deep okay too deep FIFO structure the two registers or two memory locations so read pointer we synchronized and send it back to the first clock domain and uh, which works as a ready and then we ended these two signals and make it a enable and then same thing going to the pointer incrementing the uh, or the uh, right address so that is structure is fine now we have taken care of our writing department how we gonna write it properly into the memory now how about the reading reading into the second clock domain a well, similar kind of a structure that uh, that we wanna read when the data is available so how we did here that uh, we synchronize right pointer one bit signal okay, into second clock domain and generate a kind of a ready ready signal okay. now this ready signal along with this read with the AND gate because now we want to read generates a pulse with our familiar structure uh, XOR gate and uh, flop generates a pulse and that will tell okay now my uh, read pointer toggled and now I have read the data and read pointer uh, points to the next uh, location and that information travels back to the first domain which then uh, says that okay now I am ready to write the next next byte or the next uh, set of data and this whole system continues keep on keep on going as long as uh, you don't uh, power down the circuit or the circuit is not uh, in reset state so this is a basic idea about uh, CDC solution involving uh, FIFOs, multi cycle paths implementation. Okay. Good. So, hope you guys have uh, enjoyed this lecture. Thank you for your wonderful comments. Thank you for subscribing, liking, uh, and Google Plusing. Uh, the professor channel if you are struggling with uh, certain topics subjects or you want us to create more lectures please feel free to to write your comments in the comment section or you can send us uh, an email and uh, set up a private uh, appointment for private consultation